our forests. To early BC pioneers, it must have seemed that the green rolling carpet would go on forever. Now the limits of this precious natural resource are just over the horizon. There are no hidden forests waiting for discovery in some remote valley. The insatiable demands of our modern society have caught up with the valuable supply because we all want more. More wood and paper products. More recreation opportunities. More industrial and urban development. More protection for wildlife and the environment. But it is impossible for our forest lands to meet all of our social and economic needs. At the rate we are going, the demand for wood fiber will soon exceed available supplies. But the BC Ministry of Forests is acting now to minimize future shortages. One vital part of this long-range program, protection of both old and new timber stands. The enemies of our province's forests rob us of about one-third of the average annual timber harvest. These destructive enemies also rob every one of us of the enjoyment that beautiful scenery and wilderness recreation bring. The most spectacular and the most notorious enemy of our forests is fire. Nature herself is responsible for some of the yearly losses by fire, but two-thirds of all the wildfires that rage through our timber every year are caused by man. Since the Forest Service began over 60 years ago, man has been fighting them in an organized way. But first, these wildfires, unplanned accidental fires, must be found. In the early days of forest protection, fire patrols were made on horseback, by buckboards, canoe, or on foot. Primitive lookout towers helped men scan the forests for signs of smoke or flame. In the 1920s and 30s, a new ally, the airplane, was pressed into service to seek out the enemy. But it wasn't until 1945 that the Forest Service used air patrols on a continuous basis. Forest Service veterans can remember what an arduous, frustrating affair firefighting once was when supplies were moved into the fire line on horseback when fire pumps were hauled to the scene by Travois, and when tin lizzies were utilized to power the pumps. But that was yesterday. Today, one look tells you how much progress has been made in wildfire detection and fighting. Modern lookout towers with their up-to-date communications, direction finding and detection equipment make locating the fires and mobilizing firefighters faster and more efficient than ever before. Today, patrolling aircraft are a familiar sight in the summer skies over our forests. Surveillance systems provide valuable early detection of wildfire. Weather satellites provide the photographs that enable experts to chart long-term weather conditions. Coupled with constant humidity checks, they help prepare forest personnel for the hazards of dry weather to come. Question, are lightning strikes more prevalent in some areas than in others? Computers can help provide the answer. Technological advances in data gathering and communication will help ensure minimal losses by fire. In turn, that means maximum use of our forests by vacationers each summer. Technology means something else, too. Fast, accurate data means fewer men will be needed to quell fires before they grow to major conflagrations. Fewer men, but highly trained men. While the danger reaches a peak every summer, the training of firefighters and the planning of attack strategies go on throughout the year. Then, when fire breaks out, the men are ready to go into action. Men with shovels to throw a blanket of earth on the smoldering forest floor, and power saws to cut down trees ahead of the fire, and pumps and hoses to dampen down the ground. With the aid of personnel from forest industries, which have much to lose if a wildfire races out of control, the firefighters of the protection branch run a race against time. Fast initial attacks by teams of specialists are what's needed to stop the majority of wildfires in their early stages before they become costly holocausts. It's a coordinated effort by men both on the ground and in the air. When the word goes out, the first to scramble are the bird dog officer and his pilot. 
In their small aircraft, they guide attacks made by large air tankers, coordinating their operations by radio with the fire boss on the ground. Minutes after the dispatcher has sounded the alarm, the tankers are airborne and flying low over the fire, dropping their cargoes of long-term retardant to prevent the flames from spreading. It's retardant because the fire's heat would evaporate water before it even hit the ground. Helicopters with retardant-filled monsoon buckets provide more fire control. The versatile choppers take firefighters into hard-to-reach areas, hovering above the trees dropping their specially trained teams of repelling crews. Then those teams go to work. Gone are the days of on-the-spot recruitment for men with shovels and axes. Firefighting has become a complex, organized operation. Fire-ravaged timber is the sad reminder of a costly mistake. A mistake that can threaten not only a forest, but those of us who make our homes nearby. Fast action by the Protection Service can stop wildfires but care and attention by the rest of us can prevent many of those fires. But ironic as it may seem, fire can sometimes be beneficial to the forest and to the people who depend upon it for income and recreation. So each year, some fires are planned and controlled by experts. They are not wildfires, but controlled burns. Natural fires, those caused by lightning, are often cleansing fires, providing room for new growth and habitats suitable for wildlife. It's part of the forest's evolutionary process. As man has accelerated the growth process, he then speeds up this cleansing process. Controlled burning cleans up material that could fuel a wildfire. A major disaster can be avoided this way. Controlled burns also aid in the fight against destructive pests. Often these controlled fires are undertaken in conjunction with other branches of the government, like fish and wildlife. A growing percentage of slash burning is also done under the guidance of the protection branch's fire experts. Victims of another forest foe. Eighty percent of all timber lost annually is attributable to the twin pests, disease, and insects. These dead and dying trees have been stripped of their needles. The stage is set here, a forest that contains old growth, timber at the end of its lifespan. These trees become targets for disease and insects. It is one of nature's ways of renewing the forest. Unfortunately, it also reduces lumber volume and grade. This is mistletoe. Not the kind you put up at Christmas, but the kind of parasite that takes a tremendous toll of coastal hemlock and interior pine. Reducing mistletoe means increasing lumber volumes because mistletoe cuts down the growth of the trees on which it lives. This is root rot. It's a particularly stubborn disease. Forest protection experts have been hard at work on root rot for decades. The disease thrives in old stumps. When new trees begin to grow close to the stump, the roots of the two eventually meet and the rot spreads from one generation of trees to another. Insects, too, keep the forest under constant attack. Bark beetles like this mountain pine beetle have cost us thousands of trees and millions of dollars. This beetle, the Douglas fir beetle, and spruce beetle burrow beneath the bark, eat into the wood, and quite literally bite into the income of B.C.'s forest industries. Then there are the insects, like the spruce budworm, called defoliators, because they nibble away at leaves and needles. The hemlock looper, Douglas fir moth, and black-headed budworm add to the damage every year, stunting timber growth or killing trees outright. The Forest Service's Pest Management Program attempts to reduce these losses throughout our forests. To many people, the program means bigger spray projects. It's a popular misconception. Spray programs are only undertaken as a last resort. There are other methods of fighting pests. One method is by simply utilizing better management practices. Take mistletoe. When an area is logged, a tree infected with mistletoe can be cut down, whether it will be milled or not. When that tree is cut, the mistletoe is automatically killed. Management practices like this, instituted at minimal cost, can have a tremendously beneficial effect. In the past, logging operations left behind significant amounts of debris. These dead trees became a breeding ground for the Douglas fir bark beetles that then spread to live trees. 
With improved utilization practices, the removal of smaller trees and debris means that the potential breeding grounds for bark beetles are removed as well. And there is a close connection between fire management and pest management. Controlled burning destroys possible insect breeding grounds as well. Windfalls in inaccessible terrain become staging areas for pest invasions into living green forests. Protection branch personnel are hard at work trying to find ways to stamp out invasions before they are launched. Perhaps an early warning detection system is the answer. How are you on riddles? The Forest Service has a few for you to try. For instance, if the bark beetle population is normally low, why does it expand so suddenly and dramatically? Then, after destroying thousands of trees, the beetles will suddenly diminish in number again. Why? No one knows. But there are trained people who are puzzling out the answers, trying to reduce timber shortages in the future. Think of the forest as a garden. In the spring, you prepare the ground and then sow the seed. All summer long, you weed and water. No gardener would let the insects eat the produce and the weeds choke out the vegetables if he could avoid it. You make an investment. You protect that investment. This is our investment. Protecting it for today and tomorrow is the job of the protection branch of the BC Forest Service.